page 554 of the Church Bibles. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. The second reading uh, is Matthew 27, verses 27 to 44, which is on page 999 of the Church Bibles. It's page 999. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers round him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, to see you more clearly, love you more dearly and follow you more nearly. Amen. Anyone who has watched Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of Christ, will be aware of the physical cruelty of a Roman flogging and crucifixion, which are depicted in graphic detail, indeed too much detail, many have said, The physical suffering of Jesus was real, brutal, horrible, and shouldn't be underestimated. And yet, as we read Matthew's account, there is no mention of nails, of blood, or pain. It would have been obvious to his first readers that these were all involved. Everyone living in that world knew how a crucifixion was conducted and what it meant both for the victim and for those who observed it. 
for Matthew's purpose, it's enough for him to write that the soldiers led Jesus away to be crucified, in verse 31 of our gospel reading. And then verse 35, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes. A quarter of Matthew's gospel is devoted to the events that take place in that single week leading up to what we know as Good Friday. But so few words describe the central act of the crucifixion itself. Strange, we might think. What then is Matthew's purpose in these verses that Amory read? It's on page 999. In the first instance, they speak of mockery to which Jesus was subjected both before and after he was nailed to the cross. Mockery by the soldiers, by the passers-by, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, and even the ones crucified with him. Secondly, the irony within these verses points us to a deeper truth about Jesus' purpose in allowing himself to be treated in this way. The title for this sermon in this series is Can Jesus Save Himself? And we'll consider that question within the wider context of Jesus' whole ministry in Galilee and Judea. The first phase of this mockery in verses 27 to 31 It's from the soldiers, who probably don't know anything more than that yet another wretched Jew has claimed to be some sort of king and has received a standard sentence of death that the Romans gave to every terrorist who dared to rebel against their authority. Now it's their job to carry out the execution, all in a day's work, but they might as well have a bit of fun until it's time to go. So the governor said, this one's a king, did he? Ha ha. Let's give him a bit of, uh, make him king for a while and, and have a bit of fun. It wasn't the first and certainly not the last time that a group of squaddies has ever misbehaved in this sort of manner. But arguably this lot didn't know any better. They certainly had no clue as to who Jesus was and they were certainly unaware of the irony of their mock homage to the king of the Jews. What about the passers-by who hurled verbal abuse at Jesus in verse 39 and 40 as he hangs on the cross? Are they any more civilised than the soldiers? Are their words of ridicule any less hurtful than the physical wounds of flogging and beating? This is the same Jesus who only days before was healing people, celebrating with people and teaching them about the kingdom of God. Are these the same people? Of course, we know better, don't we? We've just sung how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son. But remember that second verse, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. Where are we as we picture ourselves within Matthew's gospel narrative? What about the chief priests and the other religious people? Verses 41 to 43. They said that if Jesus were to come down from the cross, then they'd believe in him. Really? Really? How many times had they already witnessed Jesus doing extraordinary things before their own eyes? And how many opportunities had they already had to believe in him? How completely mistaken they were in their understanding. Before we go any further, let's note three characteristics of mockery. It's shallow, full of half-truths. These people ridiculed the kingship of Jesus, but it was their concept of kingship rather than his claims, which was at fault. Mockery is often the resort of the superficial who are too lazy or too frightened, perhaps, to look facts in the face. 
Mockery is often infectious. The language of the mob, trading in slogans and second-hand ideas. And it's arrogant, a form of verbal bullying, as wounding as a slash with a knife. Let's be clear, mockery, and for that matter, it's frequently used equivalent, sarcasm and cynicism, if they're ever to be used as weapons by any Christian, should be handled with the utmost of care. The mockery that Jesus can't save himself is ironically correct. The whole passion narrative is full of irony and it reaches its climax here with the writing on the placard placed above Jesus' head on the cross, verse 37. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. If Jesus were to save himself, he could not save us. It was not the Father's purpose to save Jesus, but it was the purpose of the Father and the Son to rescue us through him. And Matthew wants us to know that the inscription was absolutely true, despite its mocking intent, and that the cross wasn't a messy accident at the end of an otherwise glittering career of healing and teaching about the kingdom of God. No, as shocking as it was, the cross was the proper climax to all that Jesus had said and done right from the very beginning. But let's think about this a little bit more. But first, let me ask you if you enjoy hearing echoes. Many young children enjoy making echoes, and you only have to walk along the canal towpath through the tunnels by uh, Sydney Gardens uh, to know the truth of that. And I know a lake in southern Germany that is hemmed in by mountains, and when you take a boat trip down its length, there's a spot where the boat stops and the boatman picks up a flugelhorn, or maybe it's a French horn or something like, like, like that, and blasts out a tune in the direction of a sheer rock face. And of course, moments later, there's an echo of the tune. I was going to say it can be heard as clear as a bell, but obviously it's as clear as a flugelhorn. Now, can you hear an echo as you listen to this passage of the Gospel? There in chapter 27, verse 40, if... You are the Son of God. Where have you heard those words before? If this is the echo coming from the mouths of the passers-by, then who spoke these words originally? Turn for a moment to the very end of Matthew chapter 3. If you want to look it up, it's on page 967, I think. At his baptism, Jesus hears a, ver a voice from heaven saying... This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And immediately chapter 4 begins with, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And all the rest of it. If you really are God's son, then surely it's wrong that you should be hungry like this. If really you really are God's son, why don't you show people the dramatic ways in which God will look after you? If you really are God's son, why don't you take the quick way and come to your kingdom in one easy move? Now, as Jesus hangs on the cross... Can you hear the devil's tempting voice echoing through the words of those who are mocking him? If you really are God's son, why don't you do as you said, destroy the temple and rebuild it? If you really are God's son, why don't you come down from the cross? If you really are God's son, why doesn't God deliver you? Surely he doesn't want you to die, does he? Earlier I mentioned the passion of Christ. One piece of artistic license in the film is that a serpent appears in Gethsemane, symbolic of the devil returning to tempt Jesus again. 
biblical text doesn't include this, but it seems to me that the idea does express a truth. At the start of his public ministry, Jesus is reassured of the unique relationship that he has to his heavenly father. He is the son of God. But the devil does his best to stop Jesus from following the path along which he knows the father is calling him to walk. But Jesus resists the devil by answering with scripture. Then the devil leaves him. But it shouldn't come as a surprise that the devil would return, lurking in the shadows, as it were, as the crucifixion approaches. On the cross, we know that Jesus has scripture in mind. A couple of verses further on in chapter 27, he quotes from Psalm 22, verse 1, But we can imagine that he was recalling the whole of that psalm, including the verses that Anne-Marie read for us in our Old Testament reading from that same psalm, which speak of someone being despised, mocked, and insulted. Jesus took it upon himself. All along as he walks the path that leads to the cross, by means of hostility, betrayal and suffering at the hands of the Jewish religious authorities and the Roman political authorities, Jesus knows that these people are not his real enemies. The real enemy is sin and death. He isn't simply going to take on and defeat the chief priests and the Romans. He is going to defeat death itself. That's why he chooses not to come down from the cross. It's because he is God's son that he must stay on the cross. That's the way the world will be saved. That's how death will be defeated. That's how he will finish the work his father has given him to do. That's how God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom was never one to be established and maintained by military force. As God's kingdom, it comes about by God's means, by self-giving love. As I finish, let's imagine ourselves as witnesses of Jesus' crucifixion and the mockery to which he is subjected. Are we outraged? Perhaps Jesus would say to us, yes, and these things still happen around the world today. What are you doing about it? Are we horrified that these things should happen to Jesus? Yes, He says to us, and because I have chosen the cross, there is forgiveness of sins and healing and hope for all who trust in me. Are you helping others to know that? Are we overwhelmed as we realize that Jesus did this for us? Let us learn to be truly grateful, to worship and adore This Jesus, in whose death we see the face of God turned towards us in love. And as we watch in awe and gratitude, let's hear the voice that speaks to us, saying, You too are my beloved child. Are you ready to follow me, whatever people will say?